Welcome to NFT world number eight. I am b I'm with Legendary as always to discuss all things NFTs in the last seven days. Legendary, how are you doing? How are things in NFT world for you? GM, GM, happy to be here again. Um, happy also that you didn't quiz me on the number of episodes that we're recording today. Yes. But I would have known it. <laughs> um, NFT world feels like it's doing better. I think we've seen some volume in, in various projects picking up over the weekend. A couple of interesting things to talk about today. Yeah, looking forward to it. I'm also specifically looking forward to talking more about NFTs and less about market because I think this week has been pretty brutal. I mean, not just this week, the whole month has been pretty brutal for everyone. And we have done all sorts of deep dives into market conversations, but I need some relief. And I hope here in this hour or so, we can just talk about NFTs, talk about some stuff with utility, talk about some historical NFTs, talk about some art even that we legitimately like, regardless of the floor price. Um, and yeah, kind of bring some joy back to the NFT world, given the outrageous market behavior in the last month or so. That sounds excellent. Yeah, so guys, if 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 you do want to wallow more in the pain and disaster of the market. We're not saying we're never going to talk about that stuff. We are carving that conversation out to our Wednesday spaces, which is scheduled, and you can find the details of that on the 32 Dreams account. In that, we're going to be talking about all the things that we discussed in our 32 Dreams Discord over the week, like key market stuff. Um, I think there's all sorts of stuff to do with USDC as a stable coin, um, leverage, legendary. What other stuff will we, we be talking about there? Uh, we're going to talk a bit about what was going on with Three Arrow Capital, yes. with potential liquidation cascades. We're also going to look a bit more at the increasing dominance of um, Layer 2 transaction volume. Uh, you mentioned the stablecoin part. We're going to look a bit into OpenSea's upgraded contracts. So going to yeah. cover the market topics more on the spaces on Wednesday. So loads of real hard market talk. Obviously, we'll also be touching on the beginning of the Arbitrum Odyssey campaign, which 32 Dreams will be navigating a cohort of 60 people through starting tomorrow. Uh, so that will all be for Wednesday. We don't want to talk markets today. We want to talk NFTs. And legendary, one of the first things we wanted to talk about today was the resurgence of CryptoPunks. Yeah, um, the volume has been quite exciting to watch. Uh, if, if you look at floor prices, for most of June, we've been hovering around 48 to 49 ETH. Um, right now, we are up to 68 ETH floor price. Quite a lot of things happened. Um, Gary V did, did pick up another uh, CryptoPunk, also started to um, talk about them more in, in his Discord, saying that CryptoPunks are the thing over the next couple of years. They are going to be um, massively relevant, always will stay relevant. Um, a lot of people have been picking up the chatter on Twitter and making um, the the argument with, you know, the current correction in the market going on and a lot of NFT volume being dried out, a lot of NFT volumes being down across the board, more than 90%, that there's going to be a distinction of NFTs that have been created before the craze of 2021 and those that just quote unquote only emerged in the 2021 craze so that people will attribute more value to the historical NFTs once the space, once the space really matures. Yeah, there's always this debate about whether historical NFTs will have value. And I think initially I did get caught up in it a little bit and I did think that a historical NFT might have value purely as a consequence of it being historical. However, the more I saw the way the market react to particular historical NFTs, the more I thought it does, like being a historical NFT does not mean that something is valuable. You have to be a particular type of historical NFT. 
for it to be valuable. And we saw this a bunch of times in the market where every now and again, influencers would push particular historical NFTs and attribute value to them, attribute value to them on the basis that they were historical. And then they would just crash straight after because people don't actually want them. Um, so I think that's an interesting point. The only caveat being CryptoPunks are not just historical. I think they're also, they're trend setting in the sense that they in many ways have set up this whole craze of trait based identity profile pictures, which has essentially swept all of 2021 and 2022 and yeah, really, really trend setting in that respect. Yeah, yeah, I 100% agree with that, that historical, you know, significance by itself doesn't really mean anything. We, you, you need more than that. Like, even if you look in traditional art, look at, you know, famous painters who have been the, the great masters of the 16th, 17th, 18th century, there's, of course, you know, they have this massive legacy and also brand legacy built around their name but it only exists because you know the world talks about them you can um, admire their work in museums throughout the world there's auctions happening there's exhibitions happening and there's new details new paintings coming to light the narrative despite the artist you know um, being dead for a couple of hundred years still spins still evolves and i think as a historical project you have that brand legacy but you also need to continue building on that as a project. And you can, obviously, in the case of CryptoPunks, it's now Yuga Labs um, uh, building building on the CryptoPunks history. But as you said, I fully agree. Just being one of the first NFTs in the space doesn't isn't significant enough by itself. Yeah, ju- just being old is proving not to necessarily mean that something is value you need to have captured people's imaginations in a way and cryptopunks definitely definitely have i think it's um i think that they're, they're they are certainly here to stay but one of the interesting things about it which we're going to talk about now is obviously initially they were owned by owned and created by lava labs now that is not the case yuga labs the creators of board ape have bought uh all of the commercial well, i don't know exactly what they, they they bought the brand they bought cryptopunks out they now own the brand the commercial rights etc cetera, etc cetera. so and it's not necessarily clear what is going to be done with them like there were lots of people at the time of that announcement who were super worried because the reason that they had bought cryptopunks was f- for that kind of pure reason of well this is a historical nft which has set off this trend it is valuable in and of itself it doesn't need utility it doesn't need to be incorporated into some business strategy it doesn't need anything it just is iconic it is valuable and that's fine but now it's owned by this brand which obviously does build all of this stuff in for the board ape holders and it's a little bit ambiguous as to what their plans are they just announced this week that Noah, non-fungible Noah, I think that's his Twitter handle, has been brought onto the team in order to, I don't know what the title was, I don't know if you can see it there, but like it was just to to run the brand of CryptoPunks. Yeah, to be the brand lead. The brand lead, which obviously implies that there's a brand to lead, that there is something to be done. I don't think he'll be I don't think anyone is brought on board to do nothing, which I think is what some CryptoPunk holders would like. (laughs) Like, just don't do anything. Don't ruin it. Because every time that you try to do something is an opportunity for you to mess it up. Um, So yeah, they've, there is this announcement. Someone has been brought on to, to, to manage the brand. What's your, what's your take there? Like, are you, I mean, when we are not CryptoPunk holders, although maybe you were tempted by a V1, we're not CryptoPunk holders, but what's your take on someone coming on to manage this brand? Yeah, you you made a very important point in that. It is, you know, it's also protecting a brand legacy. It's in a similar way as mm. if, say, someone would take over the Louis Vuitton brand, which is 
more than 250 years old and would try to build on the brand's legacy, but you also have to, you know, respect the tradition, respect the community. And Noah actually tweeted about that. And it, it was the first, you know, it was top of his mind as well when he said um, in his tweet, before I say anything else, it's important to confirm what we won't be doing. Simply put, I will not fuck with the punks. So he's very well aware of that. Um, and I think it's a, it's, it's both a very, you know, exciting challenge to take. Um, but it's also extremely challenging seeing how well connected and how tight knit the crypto punks, um, community really, really is and, and has been growing over the last couple of years. So yeah, I think I, innovation will have to happen at a very, you know, gentle, soft pace. I think no one wants radical changes being brought to the CryptoPunks. Yeah, I, I mean, I kind of want to do some speculation here, which is like, okay, fine, someone says, because I'm very well aware of what people say and what that might actually mean practically as someone who, you know, worked in reputation management for a while. So it's it's fine to come out and say, this is what we're not going to do. We are not going to do this. Well, okay, that's fine. There are many things which people are not going to do. But the question still remains, well, what are you going to do? Because it's not going to be nothing. And what, like, what is on the table to do? Like, okay, fine, you're not putting them on lunch boxes. But what is there to do? Like the legit question, what what is there to do with the CryptoPunks? Well, if if I'm speculating, right? If we think which about Which is definitely what we are doing, by the way. We are speculating. Yeah. <laughs> we don't know anything. <laughs> it's like look, if say you owned the brand for like what would you do? What what would we do? I I like I would like I would love to see them, and this has been hinted in the trailers, integrated in the other side metaverse. And if you look at the other side, Metaverse, which is very bright, very 3D, um, resembles Disney in a lot of ways, a pixelized character in, you know, the way that CryptoPunks look like currently wouldn't fit in. So you would need to have Metaverse compatible models of the punks. Um, and, you know, CryptoPunks try to, well, open themselves up to the Metaverse with the bits, with the... Um, airdrop collection that or with a collection that has been airdropped to punk holders um but that's not going to be enough in a way because if you're a crypto punk holder if you want to be in the metaverse and want to explore um other other side with your punk you would need a, a kind of a visual revamp a 3d model of your punk and i don't know if that would be like fully pixelated in a way or like voxelized or if it would be more of a 3d character and I think this is one of the fine lines to walk there. I think that's a really, like, I think it makes sense as an idea. Like, look, if you want to access more of the metaverse, we're going to have to make this thing more accessible to that world. Having said that, it would just, it would, the seeing a punk that is not pixelated in the way that it is, would br somehow breaks the spirit of what it is so yeah i definitely agree it's a really fine line to tread but i mean maybe it's the case that look here's your punk for the other side or some other world but you've still got your underlying asset you've still got that historical piece i don't know i don't know how it would work also speculating further if you look at the bored apes and the mutant apes and the kennels and now the codas and the the brand ecosystem and also the amount of um, overall NFTs increasing, that might be an interesting question to ask. Does um, are, are there any plans to have more companions for CryptoPunks to somehow have a well, not mutant CryptoPunks, but just increase the CryptoPunk community by? increasing the amount of nfts that are there and that distinctly belong to the uh, crypto punk ecosystem so to speak it's an interesting question my instinctive answer to that one it would be again without knowing anything <laughs> or having any uh, reason to to think this but 
my instinctive answer to that one is I think people would dislike that way more than the other ideas like okay we're going to try to get you access into the other elements of the metaverse I think people would hate the idea of following board ape I think it would be partly due to that it's like cryptopunks don't need to follow board apes route they're you know they're its own thing I get the sense from a PR perspective that it would be hard to try to follow in their footsteps but yeah I don't know do you are you aware much of the relationship between because I guess Mebit's already expanded the CryptoPunk community. Well, it's not the CryptoPunk, but it expanded the Lava Labs community at the time. So, is is there even a connection between Mebit's and CryptoPunks now? Do people feel that? I think you go have plans for Mebit's though. Yes, yes, they do. Um, and I also would feel like you know one thing is bringing CryptoPunks uh, to the metaverse and gently revamping the way how they look and a completely different thing is extending the collection but i i i also think that would this would be a very hard sell in at least in the short term but in the long run like if other side is a successful metaverse there's going to be more than just a couple ten ten thousand people accessing it and if you have hundred uh, thousand people or multiple um, you will need to introduce additional brands characters and I mean coda is you know the codas are something completely new but we won't know how they will you know intertwine the codas into the entire story of the other side and the other characters that are gonna be exploring that metaverse so well I think that in the short term it's highly unlikely to see any extension of the CryptoPunk collection or uh, a collection that would resemble the, the CryptoPunk IP in any way. I don't think it's completely impossible or something I would ro- roll out for the long term. Hmm. Yeah, it's definitely interesting. And I suspect most things are on the table, if only because it was said in the announcement, you know, we are not doing two things. We're we're not putting him on lunchboxes. We're not making a bad movie. Okay, fine. Those are two things we are not doing. That still leaves a hell of a lot on the table. Um, yeah, an interesting point I think, which was buried in that, is that I think he suggested that one of the things he will do as part of his kind of due diligence, in a way is meet one-on-one with lots of CryptoPunk holders in New York this week, or alternatively, I I don't know if he would meet them elsewhere, but to to spend time with the people as holders to try to figure out what people want, I guess. But I don't know. That as a strategy for me, in the end, you've got to have, I'm still not clear what what the overall vision is. But maybe that's okay. I don't know if we need to know at the moment. Yeah, it's going to be interesting to see um, once it gets there. But, uh, you know, I, I noticed that in my mind, I keep, you know, comparing Yuga more and more to um, like a traditional business. Like, I don't know, as I mentioned before, Louis Vuitton, Moye, Hennessy, who manage a great deal of brands and are building the global brand architecture. And even within those collections, they're like the holy grail pieces. Um, that are hard to get that people try to access and that hold value, increase in value. And there's like also entry pieces that try to broaden and um, solidify the entire collection and and amplify amplify the brand's reach. And this is going to be interesting, you know, to see how how you guys are going to act on that global vision vision and, and trying to really evolve all the brands that they now manage into a way that's also accessible to more people and not alienating the original holders who have, you know, the assets of the highest value. Yeah, look, I I think there's going to be a really, really hard task, mostly because, you know, as a, as a lawyer, I look to all the things that I, I try to play out and think of all the things that can go wrong. And I think, not saying they can't do it, 
but I'm saying they're playing with something which is so dear to people's hearts. Like the people who hold CryptoPunks could foreseeably have like bought at some crazy low price, still hold at way higher price because it represents something to them which is way stronger than you know any other nft like it represents something really really meaningful and playing with that and i th- I, I do think they're aware of this they do know what they are playing with I'm not saying suggesting that they are not aware but it's going to be very very hard to build on top of something which many people arguably don't think needs building on but yeah let's see let's give them give them a go see how things progress we'll monitor that stuff as always on this program one of the things we wanted to educate people on in a way is this distinction between v1 punks and v2 punks because both of them have seen significant activity in the last i don't know 24 to 48 hours so is there what how can we distinguish between those two well the the v2 punks as you called them are are the collection that we know as crypto punks and that everyone's talking about and if you look back into lava labs history when they initially deployed the smart contract to um, bring the crypto punks to life there was a glitch with a smart contract. They had um, to basically start a new smart contract, start minting again, start minting the actual CryptoPunks. But that collection that was minted on the glitched smart contract, which we nowadays refer to as the V1 Punks, um, still exists. And as a com- there was a community effort to build a ramp around them so that they are basically also ERC721 tokens um, that can be traded. The only thing that they did change is they changed the background color so that it doesn't um, interfere with the original punks and doesn't lead to um, any kind of issues in that respect. Um, and it's it's interesting to see because the V1 punks had a season where they were incredibly popular. Um, and this goes back to the talk that we just had. You know, people made the claim, technically speaking, they are older because, you know, they have lived for, I don't know, minutes, hours, days, weeks. I don't know how much older they are, but they are older because they have the older smart contract. They've been minted before the original punks. Um, and that led to a craze uh, around the, the V1 punks. And then again, they also lost interest, but they still maintained you know, a stable community, I'd say. And um, while uh, crypto punks were at a 48, 49 ETH floor price, the V1 punks moved between 4.5 to say 5 ETH. And on the news um, that we've just been discussing around crypto punks, V1 punks got more traction and doubled their floor price to almost 10 ETH. Um, and also seeing quite some high sales, especially one ape punk that was um, sold this morning for 250 ETH, I believe it was. And I'm quite fascinated by the amount um of times i used punk in my last couple of sentences <laughs> <laughs> yeah we're fo- focusing quite heavily on the punks at the moment so they so that's a cool dive into the history a little bit would you say the crypto punk is still the pre- the premier identity nft like particularly in this market like is what we're seeing a flight to quality and kind of history and is that is is do you, do you think that's ultimately like the most desired one or do you think people still prefer board apes i mean punks did rally on the news and they did rally before the news a bit um, which is another topic to discuss probably. And they are still very desired. And I feel like many people, you know, and I was, also was asking around if ETH continues to dump, what are some of the things that you wanted to buy at a US dollar discount? Uh, and Punks was appeared quite frequently on that list, but calling them the premier collection would 
like personally feel unfair to board apes who you know didn't that dump and they managed to hold value in eth terms pretty good like if we exclude the land airdrop and everything that led to another round of speculation and price increase and look at the prices after that which was a bit north of 100 eth and look at prices now which are at 86 87 88 eth like moving in that range they didn't dump a whole lot so they managed to you know hold their desirability i would feel i wouldn't it wouldn't feel right to me to call punks the premier collection right now um, because it would disregard apes but i do see that the demand for punks is higher but i think it's due to the fact that there was actual news and that the prices have been pretty low or like even historically low um if we look at the bull market craze we've just been through yeah that's fair enough do you think what one of the things we were discussing off air and something we were kind of thinking out loud is like all, all of these projects are cool and it's nice to have a profile picture but in some ways it's kind of annoying to be tied to a community's group of people when it that's your identity like we are all individuals operating online with our own reputations and it's sort of annoying having you know being susceptible to group pump and dumps of your own i'm not saying this happened in any particular like this happens just across the board right where you know a bad piece of news comes out because of some founders oh sorry the a bad piece of news about a founder of a project and suddenly your identity who you've got really attached to like loses loads of value through no fault of your own and i think one of the things that is happening is in some ways we get held hostage to our to our profile picture and you feel like well i can't change this because my engagement will go down or people might not respond or and I guess the question is like, is it worth it? Is is it worth? Is the is the pro of being attached to a, a good community worth that downside risk and having your personal identity kind of handed over to to be stewarded by other people? It's a super relevant, but also incredibly difficult question to answer i think on the one hand you know you pick your pfp and it's probably one of multiple projects one of multiple communities yes they might have overlap but still many individual people who are not in all communities that you identify with and then as you said you have the community that also like you know speaks for you speaks for the apes speaks for the punks and in case of the apes we've seen a small example with the guy who said, you know, if you don't have a six-figure profile picture, don't talk to me. <laughs> and there was like, obviously a lot of backlash and a lot of apes who said, but you know, they felt that they needed to say this. And this is the point. This is not us. Yeah. This is not the apes. This is not the board apes. This is just one person. So they're, yeah. you know, kind of uh, evolved. There kind of becomes a sense of like group identity, which is, comes with a lot of benefits as you said the engagement the credibility the mutual help but also with the danger that one individual can massively put um, the brand at risk and this was just one guy trolling like imagine really terrible terrible news terrible behavior um, around a certain individual a certain prominent punk ape um Huxley, this could be, I don't know, like this, this could be that terrible if it isn't. And this is your, you know, area of expertise. Like if the reputation management and brand management isn't on point in that case, this could lead to the whole brand value actually going down and to people feeling the need to change their um, PFP and change their identity and accelerate that process, that vicious circle because they don't want to be affiliated anymore with that group. Yeah, definitely. And interestingly, it's not just it's not just an issue of like what's what another holder does. 
it's actually well what is the company doing in addition like there's various instances obviously every company has its own culture every region has its own culture every country has its own culture every workplace has its own culture often defined by the leadership and it might be the case that you know I sometimes I scroll through the discords and different people announce things in different ways it might be just that you don't agree with a certain style of communication you don't agree with a certain tone or like the type of values that a community has over time but if you've really in, like developed a persona around an image then because I, I guess it, one of the reasons why it was interesting is because we were speaking the other day and I think in a kind of off the cuff comment, you were like, well, like, oh, you can't sell your Moonbird. And like, I'm not specifically thinking of doing that, but it was interesting because it's, it, it's interesting that people can actually think that other people's or even their own and genuinely feel like, oh, I can't sell this asset because it is me like it's interesting that we've got to that point and I think that was one of my reflections where I was like oh I don't know maybe this is actually quite inhibiting having a valuable asset as your profile photo because it's like well you know it's not necessarily something which I would have thought is I don't know I think I'm rambling a little bit but I I think I see some of like some successful people on Twitter, for example, who have their own custom thing. And that increasingly appeals to me as like a really cool way to opt out of the whole system. Everyone knows who they are because they've got this custom thing and they're free from all the politics, all the drama, all the reputation stuff. And I don't know, I was just looking at that and quite wistfully and thinking, ah, it would be kind of cool to have that freedom. Yeah, I was actually... um actually looking at that as well and talking to to an artist mm. but i was also thinking about you know i you know i don't have the massive reach right now i have 8k followers on on twitter yeah um and i'm you know super thankful for all of them but it's like not obviously not the most prominent reach on twitter and even if you get to a point where you have a massive amount of reach and you know that by holding a valuable collection as as you just called it that would further amplify your reach. Um, would you want to have that trade-off? Or like at what point would you say that the personal brand, um, you know, the content that you put out, the content that you stand for is strong enough to stand by itself that you voluntarily um, say, I don't want to have that amplifier of having a CryptoPunk, a Moonbird, a board Ape anymore as a PFP. And also, you know, if you think like on the journey to getting to that point, like I feel, and just talking about me, that I'm going to be more and more attached to the PFP <laughs> that, well, kind of grew with me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, I agree. I think it's a really difficult question. I think I personally, and this is why I'm still technically not doxxed. Like I love the idea in principle of producing content which stands on its own like this content will sink or swim based on how good it is it doesn't matter who's writing it doesn't matter what gender sex sexuality whatever 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 all these factors on the internet you can tweet something you can write an article and just if it is good you know and you do it consistently it should hopefully rise and i i love the idea of that i love the idea of that meritocracy so i i as a consequence love the idea that we don't do not need the pictures to boost us however i do think that it is the case that particularly in kind of cold scenarios where people don't know you or people aren't super familiar with you i think it does help and that makes me sad <laughs> but i think it is a factor what do you think yeah I, i love meritocracy um but as you as you said the 
the recognition of the PFP right now still is part of the game. But with that being said, I think that will also evolve. And, you know, talking about brand risks right now, um, you have a board ape and, you know, potential malicious board ape holder could put the brand at peril, could tweet very, very um, ugly, ugly stuff. But I think this also will, you know, become less relevant to a certain extent once the whole ecosystem grows. Like if you have a million people who in some way by any kind of collection are affiliated with the Yuga Labs ecosystem, it won't matter that much anymore. It's like, I don't know, you have people wearing Nike sneakers and aren't good people and put out bad content. Um, and and that's not going to... Yeah, but people don't Nikes. blame the trainers. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> people don't blame the trainers and people are not going to uh, put the you know brand reputation. Or I'm not going to say the brand reputation is at risk because you have idiots wearing Nikes and talking, I don't know, racist stuff or whatever it is, right? Hmm. Um, the difference, though, is... Of course, you identify more with your PFP than you do with your Nike sneaker. Or I would assume yeah. that is the case. Um, but still, I think that gets mitigated once the communities overall become larger and larger and larger. Because I don't know, looking at my Huxley robots, it's one in a thousand. If you know, at some point an ecosystem grows to a million, it's one in a million who has raises a very racist opinion or whatever the case might be. Yeah, that's a good point. Maybe this stuff does get mitigated as we grow and the ecosystem gets larger. Um, what I'm currently thinking is because, you know, I'm on the verge of getting my personal PFP, as I said, by commissioning an artist. But I was thinking about a, and this feels like a very Austrian thing because we we love our hybrid approaches, our compromises. And this in Austria we would call it the Austrian solution would be to get an Austrian to work on my PFP and incorporate that into the new work that he creates. So that I still mm. have the resemblance of my Huxley robot, but also clearly have something that's custom made. Yeah. I Interestingly, that is actually what I have produced for me. Like I have, I have a friend who's an artist and, not for the Moonbird, which I have, but my previous profile picture, which I had for a very, very long time, basically since the beginning of um, since the beginning of when I was on Twitter. Almost, it's a meta. It was a meta hero mutant, which I still have, and he like he took some of the not the features of the mutant, but like some of the colors, some of the aspects of it, and fused that into a different person for a profile picture so it's kind of cool i'll show you it's um it was pretty cool but interesting interesting i remember your mutant pretty well yeah like it was it's, it's a good one and he like he yeah he i'm gonna show you i won't I, I won't say more it's it's pretty cool but i wonder whether yeah things like that could happen where it's like look i had this i have this thing but i don't necessarily want to be tied to it forever or tied to a community forever you know i want to be myself with element of that and then you take it and yeah you do this kind of compromise that you just described yeah or or blending multiple communities you know you have yeah. your i've seen it a couple of times um damien hurst's the currency as a background custom oh, yeah, background yeah, yeah, for yeah. your pfp or i think tropo farmer had a collection um with customized board apes where some i think a board ape was wearing a hearst um the currency shirt i think it was so like this gives you like the opportunity to incorporate two or three of the communities that you you know identify with in your pfp yeah definitely i think that's pretty interesting so you mentioned the hearst currency switching the conversation now into a bit of a bit of enjoyable art which we both have taken some solace in as the market has been very very horrendous to us you what's going on with your hearst you've been doing something with the hearst 
Um, I've been I've been watching the floor price going up. So this is oh okay. Well, that's nice. <laughs> that, that's enjoyable. Yeah. No, with with the Hearst. Um, Hearst was minted in July of last year, and at mint, um, we were presented with the decision to either keep the NFT and burn an existing already existing physical that is basically a physical version of our NFT, or go the other way around and burn the NFT and redeem it for the physical. And that um, redemption window was or is still open and is open for a year. So it's going to close. I don't know the exact date. We might close it a bit earlier, but in essence, it's going to close um, next month. And I think leading up to that, um, you know, and, and in crypto, I feel like we very much enjoy to act last minute the interest in, in the currency has sparked again and it has been constantly moving up from its lows at like three, four ETH to eight and a half ETH where it's sitting right now. Um, and I still didn't make my final decision on what I wanted to do with my Hearst because I feel on the one hand, it would be cool to have a physical Hearst hanging around um, in my apartment on my wall, but it's also, you know, more difficult to take care of and all the disadvantages that real um, art, real life art, brings um, with it. What what's the um, what's the floor at the moment? Eight point five, and how, I think. How, and you bought it at what? I minted it at it was I was able to mint it. I got on that list. It was two k. Okay, so it's like a nice turnover. I but... mean, if we ignore the previous top that it had being at 60-ish K, yeah. <laughs> ignore, ignore. Do not talk about that. Let's put that away and forget. Um, I don't know, man. I think it'd be pretty cool to have a Hearst. What do you think people are going to do? What's the What's the option? You have to burn. No, you, no, have you to burn. either burn the NFT and get the physical or you keep the NFT and the physical gets destroyed. Okay. Something gets destroyed in any case. Okay. Do you know what? I'm just looking because I actually preferred. He did another set of. Did you see these? The Empresses is a series of five yeah. glorious prints depicting carefully composed images of butterflies yeah. by Damien Hurst. I really liked the look of these, but I didn't buy them at the time. I wonder whether because you said, well, A, the market is horrific at the moment, um, but B, people act last minute so i wonder whether these are trading a bit lower because it's not in any like it's not going to get redeemed anytime soon the market is terrible i wonder whether people bought these to flip and then i'm going to check kind of forgot the about that at the moment but i don't know i think that exactly. we're physicals for them as well but i don't actually remember right now yeah yeah, yeah. so it's the same thing i think you you get to burn oh, you okay, get to redeem okay. them at some point interesting um so yeah, I actually really like the look of these ones. So I guess ultimately, like, wh what do you think you're going to do? How long do you have to decide? Um, I don't know the precise date. Maybe the cutoff already happened, but I don't think so. Um, but I have a very strong inclination to keep the NFT because there's a lot of, you know, physical work by Damon Hurst. There's, well, now more That's than true. only the currency as an NFT, but still his body of work in NFTs is way smaller. Um, so currency was his first NFT, right? Yeah, yeah. Then we had the great expectations airdrop as well that we got um, for for currency holders, which was a nice a nice surprise, nice gift to get. But it's still the OG Hearst. I think that might be the way to go, man. And given because uh, that was an interesting point you just made, you you know you framed it as he has much a lot of physical work, but not re relative to his the amount of physical work, he does not have much digital work. So yeah. I think that could be the way to think about it. And but this, you know, this again ties know. back into the historical conversation. And Damien Hurst obviously is relevant in the art world. So claiming to have, yes, he definitely to have Damien Hurst's first painting, first installation art, first sculpture or first NFT um, is, is valuable in the context of his overall body of work and brand. Ugh, you're making me want to buy one now because this is sounding pretty convincing. <laughs> Mm, do I need to buy one of these? The thing that I've been looking at in this market has been squiggles. Uh, I think squiggles, 
the chromey squiggle from art blocks which is again I, I i think this the first something is a great narrative always and the chromey squiggles as i understand it was the first uh nft minted on art blocks season one obviously they've gone on to have many seasons they've had great generative artists work on the platform some super iconic pieces have been produced by the artist and then minted through art blocks but that squiggle i think it goes beyond the fact it's just the first one personally it's it's not just the fact that it's the first one it's just it's so damn iconic yeah and when you show people they're just like what the hell is that like how is that art how is that something that they will not forget that that because I remember my experience when I first saw it, it was exactly that. It was something like, you, you can't forget that image, the squiggle. You can't forget yeah. it because of all the emotions it brings up in you. You just think, what is this? How is this art? How is this a thing? But the more you understand, like you just think, this is a this is an, an enduring image. And I think that about the squiggles more than any other piece, even the Fidenzas, even the other things like, Nothing is as simple and iconic as the squiggle, in my opinion. <laughs> no, I actually, I, while you were speaking, I was thinking, and you're making an excellent point with, you know, calling them iconic and, and the simplicity that's tied to them. Because I know a lot of amazing generative art um, on art blocks. And I can, I can name the art blocks that I hold myself, but I cannot name all of the art blocks that i've seen that i once owned and sold but hmm. squiggles yes super iconic super recognizable and easy i feel like easy as you say it's an icon it's easy to remember yeah it's just like and bear in mind i'm not a holder by the way so then this is not financial advice in any way and it's I not us not pumping hold. our I own bags like... i'm not holding a squiggle yeah. either <laughs> <laughs> They're just, I've always thought this, they're just very, very iconic in a way that captures, that's easy to understand. It like goes into your brain. The image gets put there very easily. And um, I think I think they're going to be great. Yeah. But anyway, I'm actually looking to buy, so I hope no one front runs me on this. But the price has already gone up from about, I think it dropped to about six ETH when ETH Did was it? at 850. Yeah. So that's like a 5K squiggle. Um, I saw the lowest ones like 5.856. Now it's back to like 7.3 with ETH at 1.1. This is the complicated thing at the moment. There's all these mathematical things that people are doing in their heads, um, trying to get the lowest. Realistically, I think people are trying to get the lowest dollar yeah. price. Um, so yeah, it's, it's an interesting game people are playing. It's, has appeared to be an opportunity for some more prominent pieces if you would like to pick them up is there anything else you're looking at that you like that you're thinking oh, okay this is kind of an opportunity and again maybe let's just i don't think we're necessarily holders of these things we're just we like the idea of them well i can say that i was looking at fidenza's um mm. still How, did did they drop at all during this period they didn't move that much to be honest but you know really if, if i if i if i think about them in terms of dollar value <laughs> that oh, okay well they would have been decimated in dollar value yeah but like the floor is still holding up very solid at 75 eth but it's uh, like I, i'm gonna watch the fidenzas and i'm gonna watch the market and you know i'm still mostly sitting in stables don't want to market talk right now but i'm definitely yeah. watching fidenzas um one of my favorites yeah. on on art blocks and this is something i hold um still the gazers by matt kane oh, as yeah. you said more difficult to explain than the squiggles mm. super fascinating on a technical level on the you know, the joy that you, it's a perpetual moon calendar that changes constantly and, and shows you the current moon phase, but also celebrates um, Lunar New Year and other events. And I find it fascinating that this is all, you know, coded into my generative piece of art, but they're difficult to mm. explain. But there's a couple, 
um, that I like, especially those with the aluminum background, but I can't buy them because there's none listed for sale. So it's just <laughs> looking at them for the pure joy of it. Um, but if one yeah. might be listed at a somewhat reasonable price, I would try to get it. Yeah, that's cool. I'm I'm always kind of looking at Ferocious and Rafik Anadol as well as people who I so these are people who I do hold. I hold how many Ferocious like maybe three or four Ferocious pieces and maybe six Rafik Anadol pieces. But I I I still don't have one of those moving ones yeah. by Rafik. I want like well, actually, they're kind of animated, but not in the way that I don't even have the art vocabulary to describe it. But the way that they all, or everything's kind of merging together and submerged and really, really dynamic and fluid. I don't have one of those pieces by him, so that's kind of on my agenda as well to have a have a look for in this market. But I don't know; it's been just quite nice. To, well, to, things have got a bit more accessible. I bought some Osanachi pieces the other day straight off Nifty Gateway, which he's an artist that I've always liked his style. It's it's just an enjoyable experience to look at that stuff. So it's been quite nice to, you know, just go back to what you enjoy about the NFTs as well in this period of time. Yeah, yeah, especially. And if you look at, you know, if, if you look at, at Nifty Gateway in terms of dollar value, there's quite some bargains to be made if something yeah i i was actually thinking of going on to ha- have a look because i suspect um volume there must be down yeah. at the moment not just volume in terms of jackson's but even just eyeballs of people going to have a look you know as part of their routine so i think with nifty gateway it's cool think- to play the patient game and if you like something throw out a global offer um Mm. Because if you have a collection and I'm watching a couple that don't have a lot of activity, didn't see any sale in the last, say, month, but still people have um, individual pieces listed for sale, I feel like a global offer could have a pretty okay chance to get you something. Yeah, I think that's probably wise. I'm going to have a little look later. Um, Cool, Legendary. That was a good chat. It was nice that we almost managed to avoid all market talk from that but inevitably we did stray there a couple of times out of necessity 